what's called the journey section in the Gospel of Luke. And this is where Jesus really shifts his attention and then commits his path up to Jerusalem. Of course, waiting for him in Jerusalem was the cross, Amen. imminent death. And in Luke 9, verse 51, we find this striking passage. It says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So Jesus here, he's, the time has come for him to be taken up to heaven. Now that sounds really inspiring, but what that meant was the time had come for him to die and then be taken up to heaven. Now he's down in the lower valley near Jericho and he resolutely sets out to Jerusalem, which is literally to go up towards Jerusalem, which was based on Mount Zion. Amen. And there was a well-traveled path. There was literally, uh, for all intents and purposes, a highway that would lead from the lower valley up to Jerusalem. Wow. Jesus is literally here on a highway to heaven. Now, he knows that he's going to go to heaven, but he also knows that waiting for him in Jerusalem is the cross. And for our understanding, we've got to know that the only way to heaven goes directly through the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not just Jesus' cross, but it's also the cross that he calls us to carry as his disciples. The closer you walk with Jesus, the more your life is going to look just like his. And Jesus here resolutely sets out to his cross. And this morning, we've got to resolutely set out to carry our cross. Jesus wanted everyone, especially his disciples, to know two things. Number one, who he was. He was the son of God. That's what he wanted everybody to know, that he was the Messiah. Number two, he wanted everybody to know what his plan was. So he wants us to know who he is and what his plan is. Uh, his plan that he established 2,000 years ago is still relevant, it's still alive, and it's still active this morning. Are you with me? Yeah. Well, what was his plan? To die on the cross. And he had to make sure that everybody knew because there was a lot of misunderstanding about Jesus even during his day, uh, just as there is much understanding about Jesus even today. Turn over to Luke chapter 8, Amen. verse 22. In Luke 8, in verse 22, we find this incredible passage. It says, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, master, master, we're going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters the storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. You know, uh, maybe that kind of describes your week. Maybe a squall came upon your life. Maybe the winds and the waves were swamping your life and you were in great danger. And here's Jesus kind of totally distant and aloof, seemingly asleep in the hull of the boat. And the disciples go and they wake him up. They say, Jesus, don't you even care? You ever had a prayer like that? Amen. And he wakes up and he doesn't rebuke the disciples. He instead rebukes the wind and the waves. Even nature obeys the word of God. Are you with me? There is nothing to be afraid of as disciples. There is nothing to worry about, nothing to fear. Put your hope and your trust in God because he controls everything. Now he asks his disciples, where is your faith? And that's the question for us this morning. Where is your faith? What have you invested in? What have you put your hope in? What are you relying on and depending on this morning? You know, it says in verse 25, in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Here's his disciples who've been walking with him now for at least a year and a half, close to two years. And they ask, who is this? His disciples really didn't know who Jesus was. There was confusion about him. Look at Luke chapter 9, yeah. verse 7. It says, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed 
because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah had appeared and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this? I hear such things about, and he tried to see him. Now, in Mark 6, we find Herod literally thought that Jesus was the resurrected John the Baptist because he was able to do miraculous signs. He says, I don't know who this is. I think maybe it's John the Baptist alive again from the dead. Amen? You know, what's incredible is that God raises the dead. And, and this morning, I felt like I got up and I was like, man, thank you, God, for raising me from the bed. So I, I wasn't sure I was going to make it, honestly. Uh, and I was fired up, but there was confusion here. Herod, he, he says, who is this? Is it John the Baptist? Look at Luke 9, verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? You know, he takes a poll. He wants to get kind of what the public popular opinion is of him. And it says, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. So his disciples didn't know who he was. Herod didn't know who he was. And the public opinion is basically he's just like this cranking prophet uh, who's a powerful public figure. They didn't know who he was. Jesus is about to show them who he is. He's about to show us as well. Look at what it says in verse 28. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up on a mountainside to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. You know, uh, this is incredible because Jesus brings his inner circle, the guys he's closely discipling and training to evangelize the world up onto a mountain and he's transfigured before them. Jesus was transfigured because of his closeness to God. He walked with God. He prayed to God. He prayed in private. He prayed in public. He was devoted to the act of prayer because he knew that he needed to be close in communion with the Father. So here he brings them on up and he's transfigured. His appearance changes. And then they see him. And it says that Moses and Elijah appear also, and they're talking with Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, Moses is representative of the law in the Old Testament. Elijah is representative of the prophets of the Old Testament. Who is Jesus? The fulfillment of the law and the fulfillment of the prophets. You know, it's incredible here because it says while he was speaking in verse 34, a cloud appeared and enveloped them and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. If it were not enough to participate and to see the transfiguration, a voice from heaven thunders and the father himself tells us who Jesus is. This is my son. I love him and I am well pleased with him. Now we know who Jesus is. Amen? Amen? And we can also see what his plan is. Look at Luke 9, verse 23. He says to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it if uh, a man gains the whole world and yet loser forfeits his very self. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the father and of the holy angels. We know who Jesus is and we know what his plan is and his plan was to die on the cross and that's his call for each and every one of us. Of course, uh, we're not gonna die on a physical cross, at least we hope not, uh, but we do need to carry our proverbial cross. We do need to deny ourselves every day and follow Jesus and become more and more like Jesus as we grow in the kingdom. Are you with me? Point number one, devoted at any cost. 
What does it mean to be fully devoted? It means to be devoted at any cost. Look at verse 57 of Luke 9. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. You see, Jesus is heading up to Jerusalem. He's heading to the cross. And there's a guy who sees him and his band of apostles. And he says, I will follow you wherever you go. You ever get that friend out to church? and like, oh, I love service. I love what you guys are doing here. They're so fired up. He says, oh, I want to join. I will do whatever it takes. Wherever you go, I will follow. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. You know, uh, he tells the first guy, he says, listen, I don't have a place to lay my head. Doesn't mean that he didn't have a place to sleep that night. Amen. It just meant that I'm on my way to heaven. I'm building the kingdom of God so that I can receive it after I die. I'm not investing in this life. Instead, I'm investing in the afterlife. I'm not, I'm not rooted. I'm not concerned. I'm not searching for heaven here on earth. I'm building the kingdom so I can experience heaven after I die. You know, as C.S. Lewis has said, for the true Christian, this life is the only hell that they will ever experience. Now, for the fake Christian, which is the opposite of true, amen, for the false Christian, this life is the only heaven that they'll ever experience. And of course, that includes all of the, the non-Christians, anybody that, that does not follow Jesus. And uh, I don't know about you and in your experience, but this life is no heaven. And sometimes we can try to make this life kind of like paradise, and we're searching for heaven here on earth, but it can never, ever be found. And, and, and to reconsider that, for, for a true disciple, this life is the only hell that you'll ever experience. And you know, what's heaven going to cost you? Well, of course, it costs the blood of Jesus. But for us to secure that free gift that God has made accessible to us through his mercy and his grace, we got to say, okay, what's the, what's the purchasing price? Well, it's, it's the next, depending on how old you are, for most of us, 50 to 60 years of our lives. If we die a natural death. We say, okay, uh, if you're like uh, Ian and you're, you're 20, nice. right? Amen. You say, okay, I got, I got 50, 60 uh, maybe even 70 years, depending on, on how, how old his ancestors were. Uh, you say, I, I got, I got, that sounds like a long time. But uh, as I, I get a little bit older, I realize that life just moves so quickly. Uh, one day you're a whippersnapper, or as, or as they say in Florida, a jit. And then the next day, you see, some of you young people think I, I watched a TikTok to figure that out. But Chris Jones knows that that's what we used to say when we were kids. Amen. It just kind of came back around. Uh, he say, man, you went from being a, a jit to being an, an old fogey. Amen. Now, now you, you, you got old all of a sudden. I was walking around campus the other day. Someone stopped me and asked me if I was looking for my son. I was like, you know, Ralph? <laughs> uh, <laughs> They literally thought I was like a dad. And that's how, oh, thank you, bro. Amen. Uh, you know, and, and I was like, man, I, I've, somehow I've gotten old. Uh, and it happens so quickly. It just, the, life just blows you by. Uh, John Lennon said, life is what happens while you're making plans for other things. You blink. Your kids are grown. They're out of the house. And, and one of the biggest temptations as you get older is to be filled with regret. Yeah. And you want to redo life and you want to go back and, and change the mistakes that you made. And, and you know, at the end of the day, God is sovereign and everything that happens he either allows it to happen or he's made it happen. I don't know about you, but I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. And it's tempting to kind of get stuck there. It's tempting to get glued to the past. Uh, and, and we got to say, listen, amen, I've made some mistakes. But this is an opportunity for me to repent and change and see God do an awesome thing now. Amen? You know, uh, in Luke 16, you don't have to go there. Uh, this is the story of the rich man Lazarus. And it says in verse 25, when Lazarus is, uh, when the rich man is in hell and he's calling out for Abraham to send somebody to relieve his suffering, Abraham says, son, 
Remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. You know, it says here that uh, if you went after the good things in life, you're going to receive bad things after you die. And he said, how much does heaven cost the rest of your life? Now, if you would rather have your life, Jesus says, if anyone, what good is it if you gain the whole world? If you don't want to lose your life, you, you, if you try to save it, you'll lose it, right? How much does it cost to keep your life? Heaven and all of its riches. That's the purchase price to kind of do your own thing for the next 50 to 60 years, kind of be free, to kind of just be a free bird and to seek after happiness here. It says you're going you're gonna to sacrifice and surrender heaven with all of its glory and all of its riches. It says, hey, you received good things while you were alive. Lazarus received bad things. But now the tables have been turned. You are in torment in hell. And it says the rich guy was begging for Lazarus to just come and dip his finger in water so that he could get a drop of, of refreshment to relieve him from that terrible, terrible agony. Be wary, brothers and sisters, of trying to experience paradise in this life. Instead, get close to the cross, embrace it, hug it, pick it up and carry it. Live like Jesus lived so you can experience true paradise after you die, amen? You know, it says here in verse 59, he said to another man, follow me. So first guy talks to Jesus, wants to follow him. He disciples him, turns away. The next guy, Jesus calls. I mean, this is Jesus calling you. This is Jesus calling this man. He says, follow me. The guy replies, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. You know, this is really intense, and it seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? Uh, this is not the Jesus you typically hear on Sunday morning. This is not little baby Jesus in the manger. He says, listen, you got to let the dead bury their own dead. Now, uh, what does that mean? Uh, he says, let me go bury my, my dying father. But literally, it was his aging father, meaning his father was now entering into his latter years, and he was likely soon to pass on, amen, as we all will. He says, let me go and take care of my business. Let me go and take care of my family. Let me go and tend to my aging father. And when he dies, I'll get the inheritance. I'll get all my ducks in a row. And then when it's convenient, I'll come and follow you. And Jesus says, let the dead be where they are. You come follow me now. He's not saying, oh, your dad's dead. You can't go to the funeral. That's not what he's saying right there. He's saying, you've got your priorities all mixed up. You know, you study the Bible with somebody you say, well, let me go talk to my old pastor to see what they think. Let me go talk to my mom or dad to see what they think. Let me just go and, and talk to somebody who will tell me what I want to hear. And when it's convenient, then I'll come and commit. But remember, the strengthening happens after the commitment. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. It's not about getting your ducks in a row. It's about living by faith and allowing God to bless you in an incredible way. You know, when we trust in God, he takes care of us and does even more than we could ever ask or imagine. You know, in your own strength, you can have a pretty decent time in the kingdom. You can even be saved. But man, when you really lean in on God and you let him do awesome things, it's beyond your wildest imagination. It's just an incredible adventure forever. And even in spite of the, 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 the disappointments that may come, even in spite of the trials and the suffering, you know that God is leading you on to glory and you're more like Jesus when you suffer, amen? Yeah. You know, the third guy says in verse 61, another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. You know, he says, hey, listen, if you don't understand the urgency of the hour, if, if you are not here simply and solely because of the cross, you are unfit for service in the kingdom of God. Isn't that intense? Yeah. You are not worthy because you've put some other thing or some other importance in front of Jesus and his message. You know, oftentimes people will go to a church and base whether they, not, whether they stay or not on, on the singing, yeah. on the worship. They're like, oh, you know, I just need that, 
that hill song, you know, I just need that, 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 that moment, you know, I want to feel that, just I want to get caught up, you know, in my emotions, and I want to feel really good. And here you come to our church, and you got to sing to the Lord, amen? amen. And it's awesome. Uh, and you need, and everybody, we, we have to really kind of come together and sing to God and worship God collectively, and not have somebody do our worship for us, amen? amen. And there's other things, you know, sometimes you can come to church looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Oh, talk about it. And you're scanning the people, like, oh, is she single? I don't know. Oh, is he a bachelor? You say, no, no, this is not about that. It's about the cross of Christ, amen? amen. Uh, this is what is most attractive to a true disciple. He says, you're unfit for service in the kingdom of God. You ever been behind a bad driver? Oh, yeah. And you think, this person is unfit to have a driver's license. Oh. Like, I'm driving behind this guy the other day, and he literally is just veering off, I mean, almost off the side of the road. But he's not correcting it. He's staying. I think, I think maybe he's looking in his rearview mirror and thinks I'm messed up. I'm looking at him, like, you're off the outside of the lane. You're unfit to have a driver's license. The other day, I had a person behind me. You ever have a bad driver behind you? And I'm driving. I sinned. I got to be open. Amen. I'm driving. I'm coming home from UT. I'm driving the speed limit. I'm seat belted, amen. Uh, I don't even have coffee. I'm not even listening to music. I'm just driving the speed limit on Dale Mabry, which is the highway to heaven, amen. amen. <laughs> you can't get home unless you go through the cross on Dale Mabry. Amen. And I'm driving, and I'm, I'm literally, I'm a, a safe, normal distance behind the car in front of me. And the person behind me is honking uh, saying, uh, you know, things that should not be repeated. Amen. I mean, waving her arms. I mean, doing all kinds of crazy things. And I was just like, I, I don't know where you want me to go. Do you want me to be right behind the person in front of me? And I was just driving, and then uh, they were throwing hand signs. I don't know if they were gang signs or what. <laughs> and then I just went like this. <laughs> and I knew I shouldn't have, but I did it. You know, I was like, uh -huh. I don't know where to go. And then a state trooper drove by us, and I was like, they're going to pull you over. This is, you're, you're unfit for, for having a driver's license. It says you can be unfit for service in the kingdom of God. How do you drive when you get in the car? You buckle up. You put your foot on the brake. You turn the ignition on. And then you put it into gear. You got your hands at 10 and 2. Amen? And when you're driving, which direction do you look? Straight ahead. Now, you've got those mirrors on the side. you got the rear view mirror that you check periodically for safety. You look through your blind spot. You look on the side mirror, on this side mirror. You look in the rear view mirror. And you make sure you're good. But 98% of the time, you're looking directly ahead of you. Amen? And we don't text and drive. Amen, bro? Yeah. Every tell you about the time uh, Ralph cut me off on Dale Mabry, didn't know it was me. And, and ten and two, does anybody drive staring at their rear view mirror trying to figure out how to get to where they're going? But can't we be like that where we're staring into our past and trying to make decisions about what is ahead of you based on what happened to you in the past? My encouragement for us this morning, leave the past behind you. Fix your eyes on Jesus, look straight ahead, and put the pedal to the metal. You know, sometimes you can look to the right and you can look to the left. What does that look like? When you're comparing yourself to other people. The Bible says it's unwise to do it. Right. It says it's a trap. You should not do that. Learn from your brothers and sisters, but you got to fix your eyes on Jesus. Do not be unfit for service in the kingdom of God. you got to ask yourself, you know, with the highway of heaven going through the cross, would you and I be sitting here if Jesus came down and instead of calling us to die on the cross, instead of calling us to completely give up everything for him, and instead of doing that, he said, listen, I came to give you a better life. I came to give you a nice life. I came to give you a pleasant life, a convenient life, and an easy life. Would we be sitting here? I think not. Because in Christianity would be just another hollow philosophy about how to improve your situation. You know, Jesus does not want to improve your life. Jesus wants you to lose your life. So that you can have life that is truly life, 
life in him. And isn't it awesome to be a disciple in the kingdom of God? You know, we're studying with a young man. I marveled at Michael leading a Bible study at UT. Here's a guy who's all by himself at UT. He's got three guys studying the Bible. And we sat down with a young man, and Michael was preaching the word. And I sat there, and we connected with this young man named Nate. And he said, man, for me, it was all about the purpose, having something to die for. That's When I did the discipleship study, I just like, this is, this is what it's all about. Uh, I want to I have something that's worth dying for, something that's worth thus living for. Something that's worth sacrificing everything that I have to secure. That's what life is really all about. People look for this. They join the military. Uh, they, they go after success. They look for it in relationships. And I'm so thankful that I studied the Bible, that there were disciples that were faith-filled enough, encouraged enough, courageous enough to share their faith, sit down, and preach the word to me. I'm just so thankful to God because that's what I was looking for. Amen? You know, trying to live a good life is actually unattractive to the true disciple. You know, you, you, know, you got to do life, amen. You got to pay your bills, but you got to do life without life doing you. Amen. And for the true disciple, the American dream, like we understand this is not the, the kingdom dream. What is the American dream? Get rich or die trying. Die with as many toys as possible. And, and we, 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 we ought not to be deceived. I, I believe that all of us in this room, at some level, have been conditioned to believe that we've got to get rich. We need, it's, said, it's said like in ways of like, you need to be financially secure, financially stable. Now it gets even more medical. It's like financial wellness. Are you with me? And the, and the call in the scriptures is to be uh, broken before God and let God put you back together. Amen. Uh, now we know if you're a disciple, you're going to follow the Bible. You're going to have great, a great deal of wisdom. You're going to make better choices than what you did when you were in sin. Are you with me? In every way you become a disciple, it's an incredible upgrade. But, but we, we've, we've got to, to understand clearly that God's dream is not the American dream. Turn over to Luke chapter 18. This can, this can creep in into the hearts of, of young people. This is where it begins. This is where the seed is planted. The American dream. Luke chapter 18, Jesus deals with it directly. And in verse 18, it says, A certain ruler asked him, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't lie. Honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. Jesus heard this. He said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. You know, this rich young ruler was religious, wealthy, successful, and educated, and probably popular. He says, hey, what do I got to do to be saved? Jesus says, listen, just obey the commandments. But the guy knew there was something wrong. The guy knew there was something missing. He felt it. That's why the follow-up question came. He says, okay, I, I've done all of this. What else? And Jesus says, there's one thing you lack. Go sell everything. And it says the guy, when he heard this, what did he do? He walked away sad because he had great wealth. He had too much to give up. His life had become too big. His life had become too complicated. And God was smaller than his possessions in his mind. Sometimes our worries can be bigger than God himself. And, and, and we're, we're, we're praying to God. We're like, Oh, God, oh, little Jesus, would you, could you, will you, oh, please, oh, please, help me with my giant worry. God, oh, little Jesus, baby Jesus in the manger, would you, could you, or will you, oh, please, oh, please, help me overcome my giant sin. Oh, God, little baby Jesus, would you, could you, I'm so sad, oh, please, oh, will you, please help me to share my faith with my really intimidating family. Instead of understanding that it should be the other way around, you say, oh, 
God. Amen. Heavenly Father, Come on. you know my heart. Yeah. Lord, I just want to serve you. And I got these little issues. Do you want to help me with those things? If you don't, it's cool. Yeah. And God's like, of course, my son. Yeah. Of, of course. Of course, my daughter. When you make God your business, he'll make your business his business. You sacrifice for God, God is going to take care of you in every way. In every way. Doesn't mean you're exempt from suffering. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through the valley of the shadow of death, because you will. Because you will. But, but we've got to understand that this guy understood there was something lacking. And Jesus doesn't say, yeah, you know, just give 10%. That's good. He's like, okay, good, I'm a disciple. No, it was a hard issue. He says, no, no, you got to go give everything. What does that mean? He says, you got to go give your heart. Whatever you're withholding, whatever you don't want to give up for God, that is everything. So he knew what he was saying. He didn't over-explain it, amen? He didn't, he didn't try to simplify it. He didn't boil it down. He just says, listen, you've got to go and give up everything you have. Then you'll be saved. Then come follow me. The guy went away sad. You know, the disciples are hearing this. Verse 23, it says, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, we've left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them. No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Let, let us not be deceived this morning, brothers and sisters. Sacrifice means sacrifice. Surrender means surrender. We know the story of Abraham who is called to give up his one and only son who he loved so dearly and sacrifice him to God. Now, when he took him up to the mountain, he didn't do this. I'm going to sacrifice him, God. You know, when you were a kid and used to count to three? One, two, two and a quarter, two and a half, two and three quarters. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the knife down. I'm doing it now. Two and seven eighths. Thank you. I was needed help there. Abraham took his son Isaac, bound him to the altar, pulled out the dagger, and in one foul swoop brought his hand down, and yet the arm of God stayed him. He says, Now I know that you love me because you wouldn't withhold even your only son. Now I know. Okay, now we can move on. Amen? Amen. Surrender is surrender. Sacrifice is sacrifice. Uh, And most of us are not Abraham. Amen? Uh, You've got to actually go and surrender whatever it is that God has called you to. And then God will dictate the terms of policy. You know, we can't negotiate people into the kingdom because sometimes we can get like that. Like, God will make you a better athlete if you put him first. God will make you a better singer, a better dancer, and a better actor, if you but sort of put him first. You know, God didn't call you to enhance your talents for the world. He called you to give up your talents for him and to use them to build up the kingdom of God. This is what God has called us to do. Point number two, only one thing matters. Look at Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 and sent them two by two. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. You know what's incredible here is that God has his, or rather Jesus has his 12, amen. Uh, He sends, he calls 72 more and then he sends them out two by two. And he tells them the workers are few but the harvest is plentiful. And you know what? We don't have to pray for an open harvest. 
The harvest is plentiful. It's already been promised. But he does call us to pray for the workers. And then he sends us out as the workers. We are literally the answer to our very prayer. Amen? Amen. Uh, And one of the things that I believe is crucial and vital for me is to understand, and for all of us, is that we've got a glory in the fact that we get to work for God. That we get to come to church and serve. Amen? Amen? We get to share our faith. We get to be in Bible studies. We get to go to Bible talk. We get to give missions. We get to give our contribution. This is a privilege. It's a joy to be a worker. And that's as good as it gets. Uh, Your your worth is not dependent on how effective you are at bringing more people to church. Amen? And that's important for us to understand because all of a sudden you can get really anxious and worried about that. He says, listen, you're, you're a worker. Your joy should be in that fact. But he says, we're looking for more. We're looking for more workers. We're looking for more leaders. We're looking for people that are going to take initiative and step up to the plate and do great things for him. Verse 17, he sends them out. They come back. And it says, 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However... Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, it says here that our joy's got to be in the fact that we are saved. That our joy's got to be in the fact that our names are written in the book of life. That God knows us and that he calls us by our name. Does that fire you on up this morning? Are you excited to be saved? Are, Are you? I mean, are you, are you thankful to be saved this morning? I mean, and I, I believe that many of us are wondering, am I saved? That's, that's the question. And I want to encourage you to study the Bible with the person that invited you. They say, what do I got to do to be saved? Amen. It was awesome last week seeing Manolin baptized. Amen. <laughs> Madeline. Amen. I said it right. Uh, and, and, and you see what God is doing, uh, that God is, is bringing so many people to the waters of baptism. You know, in verse 20, it says, uh, 21, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Jesus here is filled with joy. What does it mean to be filled with something? There's no room for anything else. Because every part of him, he's just, I am just filled with joy. I mean, uh, from, from my toes to my nose. I mean, I'm just, I am just filled with a joy that is indescribable, that is such a gift, because God has given me the kingdom. That is us as well. Now, I want us to learn something here this morning in verse 38. As we bring it to a close, Jesus and his disciples are on their way, still on their way up to Jerusalem. They came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried, anxious, and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You know, right here, Martha is anxious and worried. And the Greek says she's literally drawn away by many things. She's distracted by many things. The things that it says she was distracted by, if you translate it literally, is the ministry. This is the ministering of things, the waiting on the table. Says, Mary, there's Martha, and she's setting everything up, and she's getting everything ready for Jesus. And she was, she was upset and anxious and worried about it, so much so that she sees her sister uh, sitting at the Lord's feet. And she says, Lord, tell my sister Mary. She's going to get Amen. 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 You know, this morning, i got to confess, uh, we were doing the huddle up. And we were uh, going to prepare for service, and we had Aldrin and Maciel do the welcome, who did an incredible job. Yeah. And I was like, where's Jonathan? And then somebody says, he's over there praying. I'm like, he's praying. He's got to be here right now. What is he doing? He's trying to huddle up. 
And I was like, what am I saying? Amen. He's praying. And then he did an incredible job praying. Amen. So it was the Lord. Uh, great job, my brother. It worked. <laughs> it's, and, and, and Martha, she's upset. She's worried. And she's anxious about many things. And Jesus says, there's only one thing that should concern you. There's only one thing that should bring you in. There's only one thing that should have gravity in your life. One thing. And it's not your husband. It's not your wife. It's not your kids. It's not your mama. And it's not your daddy. He says, there's one thing. Jesus. God wants us to be a church of Mary's and not Martha's. What's Mary doing? It literally said she was sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to what he was saying. Isn't that incredible? You know, I'm so proud of uh, Carrie Ann, who leads the Lydia Bible Talk. She's a, I, the ladies of the purple cloth, there they are right there, amen. She's, she's a true Mary, and God is blessing her Bible talk with fruit. I'm so fired up that Samantha is leading a Bible talk. You know, you never know who you're sitting next to or who you're next to, like, in the world. You'd be, like, in the line at Panera and be sitting next to, like, a black belt ninja and not know it. I don't know if you guys realize you've been sitting next to a spiritual ninja with Samantha. And I think she's just been like watching and waiting. She's like, now I'm ready. You know what I mean? She's, she's going to do an incredible job. She's a, she's a Mary. And it, it, it says here, Martha was distracted. And yet Mary sat at the Lord's feet. It literally says that she was devoted, that she had given herself to paying attention to Jesus instead of paying attention to other things. The word devoted in the Greek is very interesting. It means to show steadfast strength, to show prevailing strength, the strength that grows and it increases, to consistently show strength which prevails in spite of difficulties, to endure, to remain firm, to staying in a fixed direction, and to continue to do something with intense effort despite difficulty. And this was Mary. When she was tempted to get worried, she stayed at the feet of the master. Turn your Bibles over to Acts Chapter 1. We're going to see the same word that's translated, talking about Mary sitting at the Lord's feet. In Acts chapter 1, all the apostles are there. And in verse 14, it says, They all joined together constantly in prayer. They were all devoted to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. After the apostles received the Great Commission, there was a 10-day gap in between that moment and then the day of Pentecost when the church began. And what are they doing? They're devoted to prayer. They were joining together constantly in the upper room, preparing through prayer for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. They were devoted. Well, let's see what happens. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, Peter preaches and replies, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 40, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. What's the fruit and the result of being devoted to prayer? Massive growth. 3,000 baptisms. Well, what kind of lifestyle did these first Christians live? Verse 42, they devoted themselves. You see, they had the same devotion, the same intense effort that the people that converted them had. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then, of course, the responsibility comes. The more the church grows, the more responsibility there is to be had. And you say, okay, things can start to slow down. And I thought about it, you know, uh, this, there's been a lot of miracles, but uh, the church has gone five weeks on campus with five full-time workers and not a single baptism. I thought, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And first, I've got to look at myself. And this, really, all, this whole lesson is really for me. 
Uh, there's been a lack of devotion to prayer. Now, it's not to say I haven't been praying. It just hasn't been my primary objective. That this has not been the thing where I say, listen, this is it. This is my bread and butter. It's easier for me to go share with 100 people, invite them to church, and then to pray for an hour. And I say that to my shame. It's not always been that way. Because when I first became a disciple, I'd pray all the time. I I needed it. I wanted it. And I had incredible times with God every day. Because I knew I had to go to him. I'd read the Bible. I couldn't put it down. I mean, I, you know how you take your bathroom or your, your phone into places you shouldn't, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you're driving, you're looking at your phone. In the bathroom, you're looking at your phone. Yeah. Sitting on the couch, TV on, looking at your phone. Yeah. Yeah. On a date with your wife, looking at your phone. Oh. You say, this is what it was like with the scripture. I, I had the Bible. I read the Bible all the time. I had to. I would write it out. Big passages. I just, like, I was devoted. I knew I needed it, but, but you get emotionally stable or a little bit stronger spiritually, and it starts to wax and wane. And there's a bit of an ebb and flow, and sometimes you're doing great, and sometimes not so much. Because you're fine, apparently. Maybe you're too fine. Maybe you're too strong, and God has to peel some things away from you so that you're reminded that you need him. And you're brought into a position of weakness because his strength is made perfect in your weakness. And those things that bother you, the things that you really wish would change in your life, you beg God, oh, God, please change it. He says, no, 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 my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. Implicit in that in 2 Corinthians 12 is that God put the thorn in the flesh of Paul. Yeah. And that thing that slows you down that you wish was different, God put that in your life. Amen. He thought it was Satan, but really it was the Lord. Yeah. He says, I put that there to teach you and to remind you who I really am. Job understood this. He says, listen, I came with nothing. I'll leave with nothing. I better make sure that in the middle, I'm doing what God wants me to do. Amen? Amen. I'm going to end the way I began. I just want to make sure that I make it to the end. Amen. You know, this is uh, vital. I said, man, five weeks, not a single baptism on campus. Now, uh, we've had incredible miracles. We saw Alyssa get baptized in August. Amen? <laughs> well, we've seen the, the church really bear the fruit of repentance, people getting restored, people getting baptized, wow. being recommitted. God is, is adding people. I'm so fired up. Sabrina's here. Amen. Uh, we went down to the ICLS in Miami. We grew, we learned, we changed. Uh, and now the church has two sectors. I said, Some, something's got to change. One of the things that's going to change is that uh, not only is uh, Ralph and Elba leading the sector, but they're, Ralph is now the campus minister for the church. Amen. So I said, listen, I we, we've, we've got to figure this out. We've got to make it happen. For God, we've got to be devoted. But the big change really is me. I've got to be devoted. You know, it says that she, she sat at the Lord's feet and gave her attention to Jesus. That's what the apostles did in Acts chapter 1. That's what the first Christians did in Acts chapter 2. Look over at Acts chapter 6. It says, in those days when the number of disciples is increasing. Now, the, the church has grown, amen? The number of disciples has increased, uh, th- there began to be some, some gumming of the machinery. Things started to slow down. There were things overlooked. There were some problems. And uh, the Grecian Jews were being overlooked uh, by the Hebraic Jews in the daily distribution of food. So then the apostles say, listen, we've got to appoint some people. We've got to raise some people up. We've got to build new Bible talks, amen? amen. So that we can, it says in verse 4, uh, give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This is the same word, devoted. We've got to give our attention that this is not only our priority, but our primary objective. This is really the only thing. Not just the first thing, but the only thing. And it went from increasing to verse seven, the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So it went from growing to growing quickly to growing rapidly and a number of priests became obedient to the faith what was a priest in the first century really this was the sharpest kind of person in israel this was a five talent person this these are the athletes the engineers the pre-med students you say these are the people like michael amen even i sat there watching the study even michael has become obedient to the faith this is incredible These are the people that God is going to use to be world beaters and change all the nations in this generation. This is who God is raising up. Look over at Romans chapter 12. 
It says in Romans 12, verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, devoted in prayer. You've got to be devoted to being devoted. You've got to be devoted to prayer. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. It says here, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. What is the challenge for us this morning? To sit at the feet of the master. In Psalm 123, David says, I look to you, O God in heaven. I look up to you for help. Like servants alert to their master's commands, like a maiden attending her lady. We're watching and waiting, holding our breath, awaiting for your word of mercy. The challenge is simple. Sit at the feet of the master. Be devoted. Hold your breath. Giving your life completely over to him and watch him do incredible things. I love you. God bless you.